one of the faces. They're here. <laughs> Tonight we are talking about the historical cultural context. Uh, I do have uh, Chris has made up a bunch of schedules for me over there, so she's made copies of those. So if you'd like to pick up schedules on your way out, hit that music stand and pick one up. Uh, so that you know kind of what we're doing each week, it'll help you out. Uh, next week we're going to be doing literary context. That's a very important lesson. That's that's one of the top three uh, that you're going to want to be a part of. Just just saying. So uh, if you miss it next week, make sure you try to catch it on YouTube uh, so you can follow along. Uh, and then the week after that is Fourth of July. I won't be here. And uh, the week after that is our UW Sports Camp, and I will be here, but I'm not going to be here here. And so uh, we've got uh, this week, next week, that'll be six weeks in a row, and take a couple off, have a couple more, take another one off for a VBS, have a couple more. So that is our plan. So we're dealing here tonight, again, with the historical cultural context. Let's have a word of prayer, and uh, we'll get into our material here tonight. Father, we just want to thank you for allowing us to have this opportunity to analyze our approach to the Word of God. Uh, Father, help us uh, all to be really serious <coughs> when we stop and we consider the nature of your Word. There is nothing like it. We thank you for the supernatural quality of your Word. We thank you, Father, for the inerrancy, the trustworthiness of the Word of God, and we pray that you would help us, Lord, uh, be more careful and more skilled in our ability to discern your word because of the lessons that we learn along the way. So we pray, Father, that tonight's lesson would be of great value and help to each one here tonight. And I pray it all in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Well, we're going to start off by asking a question. Who is your favorite character in the Bible? Um, and a lot of you might say the Apostle Paul. Um, I think a lot of the times where you look at the Apostle Paul's life, we just see so much passion with the Apostle Paul. We get excited about that. Paul wrote a large part of the New Testament, as you know, and uh, a lot of it has certain, uh, a certain contexts that are important and valuable for us to, to stop and consider. And the passage here uh, that uh, I want you to, to just kind of think about here um, is, as he is saying, I'm already poured out like a drink offering in 2 Timothy 4, and I think you have this uh, in your notes. And actually, I'm teaching from the third edition tonight, so there you go. <laughs> I paid in. I paid in. Get with the program, right? Get with the times. <laughs> and my wife has the second edition. So she's got all my notes from China, so they're all written in there, so she's all set. Um, but Paul says, uh, you know the passage probably, I have fought the good fight, finished the race, kept the faith. Now there's a store in store for me, a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. As he concludes the letter, he repeats a simple message to Timothy, his friend. And he says this, do your best to come to me quickly. Uh, that's chapter 4 and verse 9. Then in verse 21 he says, do your best to get here before winter. But we can tell as you look at that that there's an urgency on the part of the Apostle Paul. But unless we go back and we try to understand what the historical context is, we wouldn't really understand what his point that he's making would be. And so we would look at that and we would say, yeah, I guess he just wants to for him to get there before winter, and we might assume that that's all there is to it, all right? And, and to a degree, we would be correct in this particular instance. But understanding the historical background, the understanding here that helps us is the understanding that Timothy is in Ephesus, Paul's imprisoned in Rome, and they're hundreds of miles apart, obviously, and so if you're going to travel by ship, there were times of the year that you didn't want to do that. And so from mid-September through the end of May, you pretty much didn't travel by ship. And so if Timothy was going to get to Paul uh, prior to the shipping season being done and the sailing season being done, he needed to do it quickly. And so Timothy, as your notes say, probably has a little time to make the long journey to Rome. So the historical background, just from that little passage, you can see, uh, helps us 
understand why Paul is saying, put things in order in Ephesus. Get on a ship as soon as you can. If you don't leave before winter sets in, the shipping lanes are going to be shut down. And so you won't arrive in time. I'll be dead by then. I'll be up in heaven. And uh, you'll have missed it. And you'll feel bad. And you'll have wasted a whole lot of time trying to get here. So get on the ship! <laughs> this is what he's trying to say. So if you, you pick that up as you are able to pull apart the historical context. Now, a little bit of background as we talk about you know, why historical context matters. If we're going to really get a hold of the Word of God, we have to understand the text in context, right? I mean, that's very, very important. So what I want you to do right now is, um, without cheating, take a piece of paper and write down the five steps. Don't look at your book. It's right there in front of you, so you might want to close it if you don't trust your eyes. Um, but, but write down the five steps of the interpretive journey. Five steps in the interpretive journey. I so much want for you to get to the point where it's just second nature. It just kind of rolls right off your, your tongue. You know what the five steps are. Because you want to start the habit of really grabbing hold of these five steps. If you do nothing else in, in making this a point of study this summer, you will benefit if you memorize the five steps. Church, I can't cheat. You know, I mean, the Lord wouldn't want me to cheat. <laughs> Sometimes you have to think about it a little bit. But what's the first one? The very first step is what? In their way. Yeah, and, and the way they word it in our book is grasp the text in their town, right? That's exactly how they word it. You could put down anything. Uh, basically, you could say, uh, I need to understand what the historical context is. And that would be a correct answer. So once I understand the historical context, which is what we're studying here tonight, and oh, by the way, there are two components to understand in the context. One is the historical context, and the other is literary context. That's what we're going to study next week, the literary context. And that's a cool lesson, so you don't want to miss that. But this is just as cool, so I mean, you're, you're glad you're here. So the first thing, um, grasp the text in their town. What did this mean to them? What was Paul actually saying to Timothy there? Timothy, you need to get quickly. You need to get on the ship. You wouldn't necessarily pick that up by just a cursory reading of that, would you? Uh, you, would, you would have to say to yourself, well, I didn't live back in those times, and things have changed so much. And so if you just took it at face value, you would miss the underlying message that Paul is trying to say to Timothy. Make this clear, Timothy knew exactly what Paul was saying, right? He knew exactly what Paul was saying. So that is always our goal when we're trying to grasp the text in their town. We want to figure out what did they understand? What did they know? And uh, sometimes that's fairly simple and sometimes it's difficult. The second step in the interpretive journey is to measure the river, right? There is a river. This river never dries up. Sometimes it's really wide. Sometimes it's really narrow. But there is always, always, always a river to get across to go from what the text in their town means to what it means for us today. Now, how in the world do we cross that river? Brings us to the third step. We need to build a bridge. And we're going to call that bridge what? Well, you, you, you determine theological principles. We're going to call it the principalizing bridge. That's, that's what the book calls it. Just like the same thing for grasping the text in their town, which you could also say is understanding historical context. But the principalizing bridge is exactly what some of you said. It's the theological principles. Theological principles that seem apparent from what they were as we understand the text in their town, and theological principles that would fit for us today as well. 
Hence the idea of a bridge. We've got the footer of one bridge in the text in their town. We've got the footer in our town as well. And hence the idea of the bridge. Now, we want to make sure we're not out to lunch, which brings us to the fourth point. What is the fourth point? Consult the biblical map. Exactly. We want to consult the biblical map, which means what? Compare it to the other biblical principles. So, so if you're going to um, understand that I can bridge this, this river, and maybe you're coming up against a, a passage, there's a really wide gap between what the text meant in their town and what it would mean for us today. Maybe they were under the Old Testament covenant, we're not, so that just starts you off with this. It's this big. If you're Old Testament covenant and, and you're coming to us today, you're automatically wide. It's a wide river. And so you're sitting there and you're thinking to yourself, okay, um, I think maybe it's such and such, okay? And so you've got to be able to understand the theological principles and consult the biblical map. So I'll give you a little heads up. This Sunday we're talking about the Sabbath, all right? So Jesus is with the disciples. The disciples go ripping through this cornfield, and they're taking the ears off the stalks. And the Pharisees, who are hawking them, they're like paparazzi. They're just everywhere these guys are. Notice this, and they're, they're upset with Jesus because his disciples did that, right? So if you're going to look at studying the Sabbath, and you're looking at it from the Old Testament, and trying to figure out how it fits for us today, and you looked at the limitations that they had in the Sabbath, uh, in the Old Testament, why don't we observe the Sabbath today, and do we observe the Sabbath kind of, sort of, on Sunday? You see where that's going? You've got to be able to look at that, and you've got to consult the biblical map. When you consult the biblical map, as I'll talk about on Sunday morning this week, you consult the biblical map, you find out that, well... There's ten commandments in Exodus chapter 20. One of them is keeping the Sabbath, but it was different. The river's really, really wide, isn't it? Why is it wide? It's wide because they were under a covenant, weren't they, that is very different than the new covenant that we're under. In fact, if you look at the ten commandments, nine of them have a great deal to do with uh, morality and purity and so forth, but how would you term the Sabbath? It's more, it's more ceremonial, isn't it? In a lot of ways, it's more ceremonial. Does it carry over to us today? The Seventh-day Adventists think so. Did they consult the biblical map? Because you don't find it in any of the epistles. Does, does Paul teach that we should keep the Sabbath? Does Peter teach it? No. And so when you look at it, you're going to consult the biblical map. You look at it and say, well, wait a minute. I might be wrong by standing up this Sunday and demanding that we move our services from Sunday to Saturday starting next week. Right? Now, a lot of you would say, whoa, wait a minute. That's wrong, Pastor Kevin. That's wrong. You can't move that. You know, that, that is just wrong. But then do we really know why it's wrong? See, that's the key question, right? We, we, it's fine to know things are wrong. Those are our presuppositions. And we said presuppositions aren't wrong. Last week we talked about presuppositions and what was the other thing? Pre-understandings. And we said pre-understandings change with culture. But presuppositions, they're pretty much steady. They're rock. So we understand we've got to get across the river. We're going to build some theological principles. We see them. Can you give me a theological principle that was true? about the Sabbath in the Old Testament that you could carry over to the New Testament? Could you give me a principle or two? Are there any? We just chuck it right out. Rest. 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 Principle of one day's rest in seven. Exactly. That's a good point. Anything else? Fellowship with God. Okay. Fellowship with God. Very important point there that we would have the time set aside for God. Right? I mean, there's nothing wrong with understanding that. Think of how busy our lives have become. We can't even squish a little bit of time in so much for God. Mm, that would be a problem, wouldn't it? 
Okay, so the illustration is there. You can you can think it through. And what's the last point? You're going to graph the text in your account, right? So where does it all start? This interpretive journey. Well, it starts right here <clears throat> with understanding the historical, cultural context, because that's where it's going to build from, <clears throat> and that's an important um, important point. Notice your notes there on page one sixteen. This is kind of better having the third edition, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Why do we need to bother with studying the historical background of a passage? Is it really important? There is a goal in this chapter to show you how to study the historical context of a passage and persuade you that knowing the background of a text <clears throat> can help clarify its meaning and reveal its relevance to your life. So, why bother with the historical cultural context? Very simple, it really is, it's very simple. It's because of the way that God spoke the word of God to us. We're talking, you can go back and say, well, it's the original autographs. <clears throat> when I say original autographs, what am I saying? I'm saying the first copy, right? The first copy. It was when the word of God came into Paul's heart and mind, and he was moved by the Holy Spirit, and he penned the exact words and phrases and punctuation that God wanted him to do. Now, what God did when he spoke through human writers was that he was... He was allowing the personalities or the backgrounds of the human writers to play a role in this. And so they were able to uh, write these things. And as they wrote, for instance, Paul is writing oftentimes letters to churches. He is, in his mind, thinking about what was going on in that church, wasn't it? And so his letter is going to reflect the background of what was going on in a church like Corinth. So he was doing that. And what God is doing is God is saying uh, that the original audiences were very important. The original audiences were just as, as important as we are. Would you agree with that? So, well, I don't know about that. You know, we're the, we're the American church. What, you know, that, that could be a little dicey by saying that, Pastor Kevin. And we'd be so wrong in assuming that that's the case. God's word is his inspired word, inerrant word to every single generation. And every single generation, as they come to the scripture, is, should go back to try to understand what does this mean in the context in which it was written, what does it mean, and how wide is the river, and where are the theological principles, and then their application is going to be different than we're applying things today. You with me? I mean, it's, it's many generations, so, so think, think this through. Because tonight we're going to talk about some tools that you can put in your own library that will help you understand the historical context. But if you weren't too far removed, you were probably in the best shape. Right? It happened two years ago. The Apostle Paul sent that letter around. And you know the severe letter. I remember them when I was a kid. You know, it's been lost. But I remember when I was a kid, I remember them reading it in church. You know, something like that. Uh, we'd be able to relate to those things. But as time goes on, um, you know, slowly over time, some of that cultural context gets lost, right? And how do people go and find it? It would be very difficult at different points in world history. So for us today, we've got some great tools. Archaeology is doing new things all the time. Uh, I, I just think that there are, there are some positive things. Um, there are some things I think the church isn't doing very well. Uh, I was thinking about that today. I thought, you know, there was so much dedication on the part of the scribes, uh, whether they were back in the Old Testament or even in Jesus' day, transcribing the text and being so careful and dedicating themselves to the study of the Word of God. Today, who's, you know, we have this church, and our church is, is worth trillions of dollars here in the United States. But who do we have that is, like, commissioned to deeply study doctrines to try to figure different things out? I don't know, I'm just riding my bike today, and that's where my mind was. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking, you know, who, who does the writing today? 
Well, if you're a pastor in a mega church, you pa you you speak a series on you know First Peter, and uh, some of the seminary professors there take your messages, they massage them, and make them into a book, and you get a commentary. Okay, and that that works. You also have seminary professors who are very busy. They take a sabbatical. They try to write a book, and so they write a book, right? So we have these different scenarios. Well, Shouldn't we have people who are just totally dedicated to just full-time, full-out, non-stop study, deep study of God's Word? I mean, wouldn't that make sense? I don't know. It made sense to me about 9 o'clock this morning. <laughs> so, but as we look at this, we want to look at the importance of the historical context because the way God delivers His Word makes it incumbent on us to figure out what was going on in that context. Does that, does that make, is that clear? Okay. So that is our reason. That's, that's the, the, the motivation. So he says here, the bottom line is we cannot simply ignore those people living back then and jump directly to what God wants to say to us. Why not? Again, because the way we listen to God must honor the way God chose to communicate. Truth of the matter is, each passage of scripture was God's word to other people before it came up to God's word to us. Okay. So that's an important um, important uh, point to remember. Bottom of page 117, our interpretation, for our interpretation of any biblical text to be valid, it must be consistent with the historical cultural context of that text. In other words, top of page 118, if our interpretation would not have made sense back then, we're probably on the wrong track. Okay? That's just a simple way to say it. If uh, we're trying to apply things, and the application would make absolutely no sense to them, you're probably missing it. You're probably off a little bit. So you want to keep that in the back of your mind. Uh, the true meaning of the biblical text for us is what God originally intended it to mean when it was first spoken. Okay, so understanding the historical context gives us insight to what God was trying to say. We've already talked about what does the text say, we're on to now, what does the text mean? And we need to know what it meant to them so we can understand what. What are we, what are we looking for? By understanding what it meant to them, what are, what's the next step in our process? What are we looking for? What we're looking for is what is the theological principle that God was hitting them with? Okay? What, what's the theological principle God's hitting them with? So, um, last week in the message, we're talking here about a self righteous what? Remember the points of the message last Sunday? Of course you know. <laughs> we don't remember what we had for dinner yesterday, right? So, so self righteous Pharisee and a. What was it? Looking at your notes. Self-condemned <laughs> self -condemned prostitute. Self-condemned prostitute. Okay. So, so what was the theological principles? We stop and you think about it. I mean, you go back into the time and you try to figure out, you know, what was this woman to these people, you know, and what were their reactions to Jesus? And you look at the reactions of both of those people, the Pharisees and the woman, and what you see is a problem with self-righteousness, don't you? We see a problem, and that's a the there's a theological principle there that's really kind of low-hanging fruit that we can grab a hold of and, uh, and take with us. So if we can figure out, here's the theological principle for them back then, now we've got half of our bridge built, right? So that's going to make sense for us as we try to push that then forward and then eventually to bring an application uh, for us today. So our goal then is to understand the historical cultural context of the passage as clearly as possible in order to grasp the meaning of the passage. All right. Now we're going to look at what is the, the historical cultural context. And we're looking here, first of all, uh, starting there with the biblical writer. Who's, who's the biblical writer? Uh, knowing the author, knowing the background is an enormous help for us. Because once you know the background of the writer, things become much, much clearer. So if you're looking for a place to start, 
the first place you want to start is, okay, what do I know about the person who wrote this? So they give us some illustrations here that kind of encourage us, I think, as we take notice of this and, and, and do bless us. He says, um, thinking about biblical authors' background at the bottom there of 118, consider Amos. He's a prophet. He preaches 760 B.C. Although Amos was from Judah, Judah is the southern kingdom. Remember, the kingdom is divided. Judah's in the south. Who's in the north? Israel. God calls Amos, who's from the south, to go up north and preach to the tribe of Israel. Who was more wicked during that time period? The northern kingdom, right? Right. And so Amos says, you know, I was neither a prophet or the son of a prophet, but I was a shepherd. I took care of sycamore fig trees. Amos is saying, I'm not paid to be a prophet, nor was he following his father's footsteps. The prophetic tax was completely new to him. This astute farmer answered God's call to proclaim his message to a spiritually sick people facing God's judgment. Now, does that help you? Does that help you to know that? Brian kind of thinks it does. <laughs> or is it just kind of like really good trivia? Stop and think, think this through with me. Is this, is this like awesome trivia? And we go, oh, wow, he was from the southern kingdom and he went to the northern kingdom. Or is there more to it? Now you know the way I'm leading you, if there's more to it, right? <laughs> what exactly is there that this really is important to know. Why would we say this is important to know? You're teaching through Amos. Amos is a small book, right? It's not going to take you long to go through it. You make this point, and why is it important? Think the, think the process through. Think the interpretive journey through, right? Is it a wide river? Dealing with Amos and dealing with us, pretty wide. Are these just like general observations that we should be making at this point? Like maybe the people in the north would not have accepted him well? Or... Well, that is, that's true. But our goal is to what? What's our goal? What are we trying to, what are we trying to accomplish here? What does it look like? We're, we're trying to accomplish understanding what's the text in their town, but that's not where we end. What's the most important part of the whole interpretive journey? How it applies to us. Okay, the application part, and you can't do application until you do the, the, other, the other part, right? So can you show me a theological principle that derives itself right from his background? Colton? No? Um, God can use the Un, uneducated, unprepared person to do his task. Right. Right. And that is a theological principle which lends itself to a very simple application. Very easy for us to apply that then. So boys and girls, let me tell you, you don't, you, God wants to use you. Right? Boys and girls, you have to understand if God could use this farmer who was just picking sycamores off the ground, well, he can use you to do great things for him. Right? And am I off? If I consult the biblical map, am I, am I okay? Sure. And so the application lends itself right there. If I didn't know the background of Amos, would I draw that conclusion? Would I draw that theological principle out and then be able to apply it to my audience? No. So that's why we see the historical cultural context as being significant. Right? So this is, again, just an illustration that he, um, that he gives us. And there are lots of other illustrations as well that um, he can give us. There's, as you see about halfway down 119, um, knowing the writer's background and the ministry that he has is helpful as well. The Apostle Paul, for instance, he writes two, le two letters. Um, he wrote many letters, but... Two particular ones. One's the Galatians and one's the Thessalonians. Is his ministry different to both of those cities? Yes. Yes. How can you tell that the ministry is different between the two? Well, his tone is very different, isn't it? Right. Yeah, he's yelling at one and commending the other. 
So we see, if you understand the relationship and you understand, you know, we, we recently went through 2 Corinthians. And as we went through 2 Corinthians, we were grabbing things background-wise from 1 Corinthians and also the severe letter that had been written that we don't have a copy to. So we were trying to, to draw some conclusions from, from that. Another person who's a great one to look at is Jonah. Jonah, Jonah, Jonah. Poor Jonah, right? We all relate with, with Jonah. About the same time, Amos and Hosea are warning Israel of God's judgment to occur at the hand of the Assyrians. Jonah is sent to Nineveh. Nineveh. And Nineveh is like the capital city of what country? <coughs> the Assyrians. And if you knew anything about the Assyrians, did you have pleasant thoughts about them, or were you fairly horrified at them? Yeah, they're scary. They were just a lecherous bunch of thugs and criminals and assassins, right? I mean, they were just nasty as could be. And there you are, Jonah, and you're being sent to these people, and you're going to warn them that if they don't repent, God's going to destroy them. Now, tell me Jonah's mindset. I don't want to go because I don't want you to repent because I want God to destroy them so that they don't destroy us. Exactly. That was the whole process of thinking on the part of Jonah. He, he just really doesn't want in any way, shape, or form these people to repent because if the, the sword of Damocles is hanging over their head, may it fall, and may they all be crushed under its weight. Right? Problem was, that was not God's heartbeat, was it? God, who is rich in mercy, wants to send the prophet there. Jonah's that reluctant prophet. And I'm sure he was really wholehearted in his message, you know. I'm really, he was enthusiastic and all of those things. I, I don't see that at all happening with Jonah. I, I think he mumbled, you know, repent, kingdom of God is at hand. I, I, I personally think that he was in the belly of the fish and the gastric juices in the belly of the fish bleached his skin. I, I fully believe that. I believe he was like, a, a, almost looked like a leper, you know. And he was just white as could be. And so when people looked at him, they'd already heard the story of this guy getting swallowed by a fish. And then they're, they're like, what? I think he threw, he, what happened to you? And, and so all of a sudden, he didn't have to say it with much vim and vigor. I think they got the message because of the miracle that took place. And there they are, and they're repenting. And how does he feel about that, that they're repenting? Because again, Historically, Amos and Hosea are out there, repent. God's going to use the Assyrians. They're going to come down here. They're going to judge us. We're, we're as good as dead. And that's a great message to hear, right? Just before you go to bed at night, here comes the prophet through town telling you that. Sleep in peace, right? So you look at the context, and it definitely shapes the ability that you have to be able to grab a hold of that theological principle from which you will make application. So that is the, the reason um, for this. So biblical writer is absolutely essential to understand. Let's go to biblical audience. The biblical audience, page 120. Knowing something about the audience, and I just got through talking about Jonah, and just got through talking about the Assyrians as being a scary, a scary people. If you look at Mark's example, Mark makes a point of emphasizing the cross of Christ and the demands of discipleship throughout his gospel. Um, and a lot of people believe Mark's original audience was the church in the vicinity of Rome. Okay, what kind of people would make up the church in the vicinity outside of Rome? What were they? Gentiles. 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 Now that's an interesting one. Because the other three Gospels have much more of a Jewish audience in mind, don't they? If you were going to lead a Bible study that was evangelistic in nature, provided you're not living in Israel, okay, if you're living among Gentiles, which would be the best Gospel 
to take and extract these biblical theological principles and applications from? Well, it would be Mark, wouldn't it? And that's why we often will say that Mark is better to be used as an opportunity to express evangelistically the gospel and uh, bring people in. People will be able to relate uh, from a Gentile background perhaps a bit better uh, with Mark's teachings. Um, knowing what the audience is all about definitely helps us <clears throat> in this regard. So, there's a lot of good things with regard to Mark. Mark's preparing the, the people for persecution um, that they're going to face um, with Nero, and he's encouraging them to remain faithful, and he's stressing how faithful Jesus is during his time of suffering. So again, you look at the audience, and it gives you opportunity to draw those theological principles out. Now, when you read the Old Testament prophets, we need to know some things about the background. For instance, he gives an illustration of Jeremiah. It's helpful for us to know that his prophetic ministry begins at 627 B.C. and ends just after 586. Now, every biblical student should know the date 586 and what happened in 586. 586, Jerusalem is destroyed, right? So that's a, that's a big date. And so Jeremiah is prophesying up until this time and if you look at the timeline, if you look historically at the timeline, it means Jeremiah saw the revival under King Josiah that was a great revival, wasn't it? they found a copy of God's word it was just amazing, you know and it's huge, they do, do this public reading of the, the, the books and, and the people just melt uh, under the Holy Spirit of God just convicting them, I believe it was just really neat but they also saw the fall of Assyria, the rise of Babylon. They saw the first siege of Jerusalem, 598, 597, and the destruction in 586. So he preaches against the sins of Judah. He predicted the destruction of Jerusalem, and he predicted the Babylonian exile as well. And yet he also gave words of encouragement and hope. Um, he, you know, a verse like Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Isn't that fascinating? And, and that that verse pops out in the midst of all the other things that are going on. Is it helpful to know the biblical audience? Sure is. Biblical author, biblical audience. Knowing that will definitely enhance our ability to understand the scriptures. Um, in New Testament letters, sometimes you're going to pick up... Um, 1 John, for instance, there's early Gnosticism. Colossians, for instance, there's false teaching, uh, and they're arguing uh, to refute the false teaching. Oftentimes, you'll see the Apostle Paul, as I've mentioned before, he starts out the epistle with theology, kind of theology proper, kind of systematic theology. And he lays out all of that theology, and then he breaks right into the application part. And he starts giving you the nuts and bolts. You know, it's like Ephesians, you know, we're in the doctrine, Romans, we're in the doctrine, and all of a sudden we're breaking out with be kind one to another. So you have, you have everything built upon something of, of great importance. But usually in those situations, the audience, once you find out some things about the audience, you're finding out, well, they were a little concerned about something that was going on. And so this is the reason why this addresses it. 1 Thessalonians, what's the problem with the audience? 1 Thessalonians. Resurrection. The resurrection. Look at our loved ones passing away. You know, uh, we didn't expect that. We thought as a follower of Christ that our loved ones would never pass away. We thought Jesus is coming soon, and the whole idea of eternal life is that we get eternal life. <coughs> More revelation is needed, isn't it? So God gives to us 1 Thessalonians 4. He gives to us 1 Corinthians 15. Um, and we build that doctrine of eschatology on more revelation that God gives to us. So, biblical writer, biblical audience, very important. Other historical, cultural elements. Uh, let's just pick out, there's three here on this page, 121. These other historical, cultural elements, for instance, uh, geography and topography can play a role. If you get a chance to go to Israel, 
you should go to Israel. Uh, they always say, if you go to Israel, it will open up your understanding of God's word. And part of that has to do with this. The geology, the, the topography of the land, being able to see how things laid out uh, firsthand is very, very helpful. How, how many have been to Israel? Okay, several of you have. And you know it's true. It's just amazing. Uh, you sit back and you think of that. Um, they give the illustration in Luke 10 of a man who was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. And it makes mention of the fact that Jerusalem's at 2,500 feet above sea level, and you're going to Jericho, that's 800 feet below sea level. Wow. We know Galilee's 600 feet below sea level. So, so you, you start to understand the topography. Um, Karen and I had the opportunity when we were there to, to walk that. Um, we called it the Wadi Walk. The Wadi was where the water goes down through and everything. And that was, that was really exciting. They made the point of saying that this was a very dangerous thing to do, to, to walk that route between those two cities. And so you have the Good Samaritan. Well, it's no wonder the guy beat up and left for dead. It was a rough place. And robbers oftentimes frequented that, that highway, so to speak. Um, but it was quite a descent on down through to the bottom. There's a Roman aqueduct that goes down. Do you remember that? Remember walking on the sides of that Roman aqueduct? It's like this wide. I'd never do it now. Was it this wide? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We were in our 20s. What can I say? Um, but uh, it, it's just amazing. And so it comes alive. You look at those types of things and you say, wow, I mean, that's, that's pretty, pretty interesting. So the topography does play a role in understanding. I also think of, when I think of topography, we, we stood there in the valley, they painted the picture for us of the Philistines on one side and the Israelites on the other side, and there's Goliath, and he's down there challenging the Israelites, and they're standing up on the other hill going, oh, who wants to go down there? <laughs> Not me. <laughs> and you're thinking, they're thinking to themselves, you know what? We've got a pretty good way to break. If we need to run, we can run. And they, We'll get ahead of them because they got to climb the hill to chase us, right? So we're already at the top, and we're not going down the bottom unless we have to. And David says, hey, I'll go down there. And they're thinking, see ya. It's nice knowing you. Um, but wow. So all of those things do help us um, understand. And I'll, that'll be relative here in a couple minutes. One of the most productive areas, number two, of background study relates to the social customs. So knowing something about Greco-Roman household codes is important, especially if you're studying, for instance, Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, 21, um, the Apostle Paul uses the household code concept, but he transforms it. For instance, here's great stuff to know. Greco-Roman codes told husbands to make their wives submit, but they never listed love as a duty of the husband. Do you know that? Isn't that something? Never told them. That, that was not part of the household code. But they did tell him, you better, you better make your wife submit. So Paul, God, tells us in his word that husbands are to love their wives like Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. So Paul's exhortation for all the members of the household is to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And that's even more radical of a teaching of the day. Now isn't it funny that God gives this radical teaching on the relationship of men and women back there in Ephesians chapter 5, and the society is going, what? You're out of your mind, Paul, forget it, you know? Well, what do you mean, love our wives like, like Christ loved the church? I mean, that's ridiculous. And, and, but the church grabbed a hold of it, and the world looked at it and thought they were crazy. Now you read the same passage to the world today, and the world thinks we're crazy. But they're coming from the other side. And, and yet, um, don't, they, don't miss the point. God's word was all about changing how men related to women in an ungodly way and made them love their wives and submit to each other. And, and it, it was very, very positive. And now people look at that and say, well, <laughs> they miss the point a lot of times. And uh, oftentimes, if you miss the, the household code that was spoken of prior to the giving of that scripture, and you'll, you'll miss the whole point of that. So there again, there's something that's culturally relevant. Number three, note again the parable of the Good Samaritan. Jesus' audience, original audience, um, would have been shocked and insulted by the fact that Jesus has the two Jewish religious leaders doing nothing to help him, while the Samaritan proves to be the man's neighbor. 
We know this because in the culture, Jews despise Samaritans who are considered half-breeds. In the parable, for instance, of the prodigal son, we think nothing of the father running to greet his son, um, but we learn that elderly Jewish men were considered much too dignified to run. We begin to see that Jesus is telling us how God feels about and responds to sinners when they come home. If you've ever been in the far country spiritually, you'd be glad to know that when you decide to return home, God stands ready to ditch his dignity and run to meet you. That's cool. So all these things are, are very important. Another one, about three quarters of the way down to 122, pay attention to political issues. Political issues, especially in Paul's relationship to Roman government, you'll see political issues kind of bleed through. Um, you know, it's illegal to beat uh, and imprison a Roman citizen without a trial. Um, that happened to Paul, and Paul calls him out on it. And that's Acts chapter 16. Um, so a lot of these things are, are going to play into our understanding. So they're good things. They're good things to know. Now, let me take about five minutes and just kind of talk about some of the dangers associated with studying background. All right? One of the biggest dangers um, that we have to watch out for is... Inaccurate, inaccurate background information. So there's a lot of things that float around out there that may or may not be correct. And over time, they tend to weave themselves out. But so often, things get repeated over and over and over again. And then what do we do when we repeat things over and over and over again? We believe them. We believe them. We just accept them as true. In fact, the illustration that they give may cause you a little heartburn. <coughs> Matthew 19, Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it's hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. So, you've maybe heard it explained that in the gate of the city there was a camel's gate. And it was a small little gate. So you had the main gate, and when the doors were closed, so no one could go in and out, there was this very small, kind of a square box made out of stone, the width of the wall, and the camel <clears throat> would be made to get down on his knees and shuffle through that gate in order to get onto the other side. I was told that by a very reputable professor. <laughs> and the problem with that is it's not true. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. It's just not true. It was a great story. And it really, you know, it kind of made sense. And so if you're looking to try to understand Matthew 19, 23, and 24, you're looking at it and you're going, okay, so what did Jesus mean when he said it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle? Oh, yeah, he was talking about a camel's gate. And he gets down there and he goes through. So let me ask you this question. If it's not true that there's a camel's gate that they would go through, if it's not true, what did Jesus mean as he was teaching that? All right, literally, it's going to be hard, right? It's going to be hard. Then for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. So it's so much more practical. It's just kind of straight up, and, and this is the way it is. Uh, but somewhere along the line, someone got that idea about the camel's gate, and it was pretty well spread. Okay, How many have heard that, that they shuffle along? And, okay, so sorry. On YouTube. It's on YouTube. It's on YouTube. The professor said they found it. Yeah. <laughs> the, the gate. There you go. The camel snuck in. The problem, here's what the problem is, and I'm going to go back to our second lesson. What was our second lesson all about? What was the second lesson all about? It was sentences, right? And we were trying to determine what the text was means says. says what does the text say about the camel I have a needle right yeah. it doesn't say anything about a camel's gate 
whether they have them or don't have them. That's not what it says, right? And so again, we have to be very careful to be honorable to the text because taking liberties is not something that we want to make a habit of doing, right? We want to be pretty straight up with the text. I'm pretty sure that an eye of a needle is the same thing back in their day as it is today. And if Jesus came on the scene and he said, it's harder, you know, it's going to be hard for that camel to go through the eye of the needle, we're going to look at it and say, wow, that camel's never going to make it through that, right? Right? And those that are rich are going to have a really hard time, except for the grace of God that would come in and, and would save them from that. There would be no way possible. Okay? So, again, that's just something for you to think about. Have to be careful, and uh, that's just one example. But there are other examples um, of, of things that are just not tremendously accurate. We have to be careful. Does anybody think of any other illustrations of something that's inaccurate? I'm sure we all know them. We just can't think of them because we don't know they're inaccurate. We just keep repeating them. Someday somebody might tap us on the shoulder and say, oh, by the way. Yeah. And, and the interesting thing is, with, with regard to the eye of the needle, I do remember standing there, and there was that small opening. And that's why the professor, do you remember that there? That's why the professor said that, oh yeah, that's where the camels would come in. And it was there. It was there in the gate. The problem is, it, with more historical research, it can't be justified that that was normative in any way, shape, or form, that the camel would actually go through that thing. Yeah. People, maybe people did after the thing was closed. You know, they were drunk, staggering around outside, they want to get in, or whatever, I don't know. Yeah, so, but it, it's worth noting. It's worth trying to figure out what is the truth. Question, comment? Okay. Number two, second danger, elevating the background of the text above the meaning of the text. Okay, you get so enthralled with the historical background and the historical culture, you just go running with that. And it's fascinating, and you've got 20 minutes to speak, or 30 minutes to speak, and so for 20 minutes, all you do is talk about this historical context, because it's so fascinating. Have you ever read about King Agrippa and Bernice? Well, that's pretty interesting stuff. Family history, um, pretty, pretty amazing. It really is. I remember taking a, a course, a New Testament, um, New Testament theology, and we went through, and it was just amazing. I mean, you can't even imagine some of the things that went on. They said they used to say it was uh, safer to be Herod's pig uh, than his son. He had a better chance of living. I mean, he was killing family. It was terrible. Um, but you can get off onto those types of things, and you can study the background so much you can lose yourself in that background. So that's a danger as you study the background. And finally, he says, we caution you not to let yourself slowly evolve into nothing more than a walking database of ancient facts. Okay? Remember the purpose. The purpose for understanding the historical context is so that we can grab a hold of those theological principles because that's how we build a bridge. And we're into building a bridge because there's, there's not a river that's wide enough to just step across without having those theological principles. So we... We are really, really looking for that. All right? What are some tools that we can use to help us uh, determine the historical culture um, and the context of the whole book? And there, here's the questions. Who was the author? What's the background? What, when did he write it? What was the nature of his ministry? What type of relationship did he have with the audience? Why was he writing? Uh, who was the biblical audience? What were their circumstances? Uh, I, I know a study, and, and maybe sometime we'll do it here, but it's um, Through the Bible in a Year. I don't know if anybody's done Through the Bible in a Year, but when you come to the different books, you're always looking at the time when it's written, the author, the background, and the main theological points. And you kind of get a whole grasp chronologically for all of Scripture. And it's, a, it's a neat, neat study. But how do we find this? Uh, where do we go to find it? Bible handbooks. Um, you, might, you might have a Bible handbook. Uh, there's, all of these have suggestions at the bottom. 
And uh, Haley's Bible Handbook, that's been around, it says 2007, but it was really written in 1777. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I remember one point, I think I had four of those. And they're, they're, they're okay. I mean, they'll give you a little bit of background. But a Bible Handbook um, can be helpful to you. They're just not deep. And there's an example there of James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8, um, speaking about wisdom. Um, and that, that can be helpful to you. Old Testament and New Testament introductions and surveys can also be helpful. Uh, if you're looking for a book, uh, there's, a, there's several here that are listed. Um, you know, what the New Testament authors really cared about, the New Testament and antiquity, an introduction to the New Testament. Um, those, are, those are all uh, good things that you can grab a hold of and they can help you. Commentaries, is a, uh, that's another one. Obviously, um, I think more and more of the newer commentaries, <clears throat> you're starting to see, you're starting to see some uh, more historical context brought into it, and so it's it's uh, more helpful. But a little word here about commentaries. This this commentary here by R. C. Lenski, uh, New Testament. Uh, New Testament uh, commentary was pretty much the standard when I came out of seminary. Everybody was buying Lenski. And it cost you a couple hundred dollars, which was like a week and a half's worth a week of work, you know. And so um, I, they, they could be had for a lot less now. But that was a mainstay. Problem is, with any commentary that you get, you need to know what? What do you need to know? What is his... <laughs> What's his presupposition, right? Because they all have presuppositions. And they told us when I was in school, Lenski, he's liberal. So you have different things that bleed through here. You're going to have messed up things, talking about sacraments, and you know it's not necessarily always faith alone. So you, you can, it can get a little dicey. So you want to be careful. I, I'm not suggesting you buy this at all. I'm just making a point of saying that there are things out here uh, that can uh, be a little confusing. Uh, this is kind of piggybacked off of uh, Myers' commentary set, and uh, Myers was a Lutheran, so you have some Lutheran theology flowing through there. Um, other commentaries. Uh, this, for instance, is uh, the John MacArthur New Testament commentary on Galatians. <clears throat> and in most of his commentaries, he's doing a lot of uh, historical uh, context. And he'll tell you what the background is and so forth and give some backdrop before he brings his theological uh, principle or his uh, application. That one's worth, um, that, that's worth having if you want to buy a set of commentaries. If you want to buy commentaries, you want to make sure that they're not uh, too technical. You, you, just, you just don't want something that's too technical. You could go online and you could Google up what is the best commentary on any book of scripture? I do it all the time. I'm going to start a new book study, and so I'm going to find out, you know, what's the best commentary on the book of Mark? Just did it recently. Bought this book, number one, ranked by I don't know how many people. <laughs> it, it's so technical, it's not even good for, it's not any help to me. It's just, it's just, I mean, it could be on little points. Like if I'm trying to figure out, you know, which way a Greek word is being used, okay, I, could, I can go there, but I am not going to use this for most of what I'm doing. It's really, and so there's, my point is, I'm not, I'm not, all of us, there's stuff that's just too technical for us, right? And if you don't know Greek, um, for instance, you'll run into, um, certain commentaries that will utilize uh, a lot of Latin, and maybe you're good with Latin, and, and you can pick right up on that. Uh, my Latin skills are poor, and so when I go to the Old Testament standard, back when I was a kid, um, coming out of seminary, you know, Kyle and Dalish, they were the, that was the set you wanted, so I have that set. He had a lot of Latin in there, and I wish I'd learned Latin. That would have been something I should have paid attention to and should have taken, and did not, did not. So, um, but anything that's too technical, so when you're, if you go online and you're looking for something, don't grab the most, the number one rated thing necessarily. Try to pay attention to how technical it is. If it's filled with Greek 
and you know tenses and all that kind of stuff, it's really not going to help you. So just just be aware of of that. All right, and I'm always available. You can email me. I'd be happy to um, to try to help you in any way that I can. Um, this is technically a uh, commentary. His theology is sideways, and it's uh, William Barclay. His, his theology is totally sideways, but that's the best historical context you can find usually. I will, I will say that about those, all right? Um, flipping over there to Bible atlases, Bible dictionaries, encyclopedias. This was the standard for encyclopedias a thousand years ago. So you can, but he's got notes in there, so you can go and look up what, what's current. But this was the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia. How many have ever heard of the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia? Nobody. So when I came out of school, this was so well known, we referred to it as ISBE. That's what it was. Did you get your ISBE set yet? And uh, you go through this, and uh, here's, here's a whole section on Babel and uh, Babylon. And it, it is profound, all of the information that you can pull out of that. Just profound, just page after page, detail after detail, baptism, uh, you know, I mean, any, any basic component of scripture you can find in Isby, and it's, uh, it's pretty cool. I like it, but I like books. Um, here was a book that you could pick up that's, I don't know if it's on your list or not, but it's by James Freeman. And it is a complete guide to the origin and significance of our time-honored biblical tradition. It's called Manners and Customs of the Bible. Manners and Customs of the Bible. Uh, number 416, worms feeding on the body. The worm shall feed sweetly on him. He shall no more be remembered. Hmm. It's an oriental opinion that worms exist in the skin and in all parts of the body. But they're among the principal causes of its destruction. Roberts quotes from an ancient Indian medical work in which 18 kinds of worms are enumerated. <laughs> okay, so, so <laughs> but the, this, is, this will give you all kinds of background and, and different things. You can pull all kinds of things if you want to dazzle your uh, students in Sunday school or make them sick. <laughs> you can do that. This is, um, this is something that I just picked up here um, last year. It's called the Baker Book of Bible Charts, Maps, and Timelines. This is one really cool book. I mean to tell you, it really is, it's really neat. It just kind of goes on through chronologically. Uh, there's some, some terrific maps. Uh, there's some great background. Um, even has a section here, Wild Animals of the Bible. What is that book called? Uh, it's the Baker Book of Bible Charts, Maps, and Timelines. And it says here the price is $29. Let's see if you can buy it cheaper. <laughs> I paid 20 at a pastor's conference for it. I thought it was a pretty good deal. Somebody's going to buy it for 6 and I'm going to feel bad. Uh, but that's a, that's, a cool, that's a cool book. Keep your eyes open. You never know when you'll come across something that uh, can be used and can be valuable for you. I paid $1 for this book. It is not written by Christians. It's written by two Jewish men, Herzog and Mordecai Gichon. And it is called Battles of the Bible. Battles of the Bible, a modern military evaluation of the Old Testament. Modern, yeah, it's fascinating. It has, um, there's all kinds of uh, little arrows, and they show, you know, Battle of Ai and Joshua's conquests and, you know, all these different things. And um, I, I don't know if it's 100% accurate. You can read it with a grain of salt if you could ever find this book. Um, but my point is, keep your eyes open. It's, uh, this is probably back in 1945 when I was a kid. Um, 1978, it was, it was, and it says 1795, and I scored it in a bookstore for a buck. So, keep your eyes open. You never know what you might find. So those are some of the, some of the, the, the tools that you can get a hold of um, that'll help you and uh, can be a valuable uh, asset to have. And the other thing is, and it shouldn't be overlooked, uh, because some of your good study Bibles today have really great components there with historical context. 
Um, so it might just save you a whole lot of time if you went out and bought a, a decent study Bible that's got good notes. So, um, you know, I just encourage you to, when you go to a Christian bookstore, you're leafing through these books, that's one of the difficulties when you're buying everything online, you can't necessarily see those types of things. But if you're in the bookstore and you're looking through, pay attention to historical context. Look for, you know, does it give me some historical context that, if that is helpful? And because uh, I, I think it, um, it, it can be very helpful. I bought uh, Gene Getz's, he's a professor down at uh, Dallas Theological, and he's got a, he's got a Bible, it's, it's based on the Holman, which is now the Christian, Christian version. What is it? The Christian Standard Bible? The CSB. Yeah, so that's the additional, right? But uh, you can buy Gene Getz's Bible. He's got terrific notes, and he's been a prop for a long time. He's, got, he's actually got uh, uh, the barcode reader things in there, so you can take your phone, and you can put it over the barcode reader, and it'll read it, and it'll pop up on your phone, him teaching the lesson on that particular <laughs> subject. Isn't that pretty cool? That is really cool. So, I mean, you know, that's, that's pretty reliable stuff. And we've come a long way when you finally get to that point, I feel. I feel like that's really pretty cool. Um, because he's going to give you some, some good teaching, and uh, it, it can be very, very helpful. So, any questions that you have? Yeah? Do you have a list of just some good study bottles to look at? Uh, I, don't, I don't know if he lists them here. Um, some of your main ones, um, you know, in the, in the past, I, I, I haven't used a lot of study Bibles um, myself just because I don't usually lug a study Bible up there. And usually when I'm in my office, I'm using other tools uh, that I have. But I know uh, Karen has MacArthur's study Bible. I like the notes in that. And I went out and bought a hard cover of that just so that I could have it, so that I could go to it. Um, pretty thrilled, pretty, pretty good. Uh, Getz is another one. Um, and I'm not that experienced with uh, some of the others. You know, back in the day, people had Schofield Reference, you know, I mean, they had a Schofield Reference Bible. They used to, the Ryrie Study Bible was huge, right? And the Thompson Chain Bible, people used to go through and track all the scriptures. What's that? Yeah. Yeah. And so there's just uh, a lot out there. Do you recommend any um, ancient sources, so like Josephus or Eusebius? Do you recommend, are there any books that you recommend around the time of yeah, I mean, if you're if you're looking for some of the historical um, components, and you can and you can pick up uh, Josephus's writings, that's terrific. I mean, I have got, I've got a lot of weird stuff that I wouldn't want to like confuse people with. Like I like I have a whole set, of, I have a whole commentary set. It's like seven volumes of um, you know pre Nicene stuff. So I don't know. I mean, that that would weird people out. But if you're interested in it, there is some cool stuff out there floating around. So, and, and that stuff, um, a lot of times, uh, CBD, you can, you can pull some great deals out of CBD. If you ever go up to CBD, they have, they have their warehouse sale. And so, well, don't quit that there. <laughs> I bought Karen a couple Bibles up there. I got her a couple study Bibles, and uh, people turn the Bibles in. Um, and you might be missing a page or something in the chair. And, uh, <laughs> and they have their names embroidered right on them. So you can get them at a really good deal. <laughs> so you get, you get a little uh, like brass thing with Karen's name on it. And I just stuck it right over <laughs> so-and-so's name. And gave it to her. Yeah, I mean, you, know, you get a $50 study Bible for like eight bucks. And, you know, I, I, bought, I bought commentary sets and I, and, and I thought, man, I score a deal on this. This was like 150 bucks. I just bought it for 35. Then you get home and you realize you're missing volume three, volume. I, I still have a set, I have a set commentary set right now. I'm still buying the volumes to fill it out. <laughs> I had no idea. I thought, this is a little light. Well, I don't think too much about it, right? But if you go up there when they have the warehouse sale, you can score all kinds of stuff. I mean, if you're looking to do that, I mean, for, for a little light. Now, let me just say this, because a lot of people aren't interested in, in books. They're not interested in all of this. 
Uh, Logos is the place to go if you want to buy, um, you know, uh, software that has thousands of references on it. And Logos has several different uh, levels that you can buy. And they'll tell you, you know, this is for a layperson in a church, this is for a pastor, this would be great for a seminary student, and they just get more expensive. Um, I have Logos on my computer. It's very handy. You can pull up charts. You can pull up all kinds of things. I can type Luke in, and I can get 25 commentaries on the book of Luke right there. But I'm still a page person. I like to have that. But I like to be able to take my laptop. If I'm away and I'm traveling and I want to study, I can literally go into a coffee shop, sit down, pop the thing open, and start working on a message even without having my books because I literally have you know, almost 10,000 books on that computer. It's all online, you have to be, it's not like it's on my hard drive, it's all, you know, through the internet. But Logos is really, really worth it, um, you know, if you don't want to chase lots of volumes, depending on how serious it is that you want to study, um, and how big your wallet is. Mm -hmm. It's how big your wallet is. <laughs> I bought it when it was cheap. And I thought it was a lot of money back then. <laughs> Uh, and then they said, well, upgrade to this next one and we'll give you credit. And I said, yeah, okay. And I think I spent like six or eight hundred dollars, maybe not, it wasn't over a thousand, I know that. And I thought, oh, okay. And I got what they said, this is what pastors need. Well, then they've got all these different levels. So then I thought, okay. And they're like, well, we'll give you five hundred dollars credit, you know, and you can upgrade to the next one. And they just give you the code for it and go home and just download it all and away you go. But it was like, oh, that's. $30,250 ago. So I'm like, oh, really? Yeah. And then you knew it was bad when they had a payment plan. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay, in 10 years you can pay off your. Yeah, no, that's okay. Uh, there's other commentaries uh, that are helpful if you don't want to do like these multi volume sets. If you just want to get one or two, I know. I don't have the New Testament one, but uh, Liberty Commentary, they had a New Testament and an Old Testament, just two volumes, they're very good. Loaned out the New Testament, don't have it anymore. Um, yeah, um, there's uh, Barnes's Notes, I picked that up when I was up at CBD for very, you know, little money. Um, Wolver and Zook. What's that? Wolver and Zook. Wolver and Zook, yep, yep. Yeah, that's kind of a standard, you know, back back in the day. Yep. Uh, do you find yourself comparing commentaries a lot, or and especially say uh, contrary points, like yeah, to figure out what's going on? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, today I was working because uh, I'll be teaching this Sunday the ABF class on Noah, and our notes skip chapter five because it's a nightmare um, to interpret. And I was digging around on that, but I was looking at different views, and it was it was you know fun to compare it, <clears throat> especially when they're using the Hebrew and they're looking at the, the different. So you got two different people that are looking at the same Hebrew text, and the word choices on both parts are different, and you're trying to figure out well why did you choose this and why did you choose that. So that's kind of what you get into. I would encourage you. Um, I would encourage you though, if you're looking for commentaries, to get someone who's going to be dependable most of the time. Gonna stay, you know, there's always those out there that are trying to be creative and trying to introduce some new new things that are really not all that well supported. And it can be really a, a headache more than a help. So and again if you have questions about commentaries, I can you know dig into one, find out if you think it's a good idea, I can give you my opinion. Happy to do that. All right. Any other questions? Let's have a word of prayer. All right. Heavenly Father, we just again want to thank you for the preciousness of your word. We thank you, Father, for the day and age in which we live that allows us to have these types of tools, Lord. And we pray, Father, that um, we be blessed by them. Help us, Father, to, uh, to be able to extract that theological principle uh, from a text that we understand and that we can uh, grasp, Lord. So again, I just thank you for the opportunity tonight that we've had to talk about the historical context. Bless each one who's come tonight, Lord. Just give them a great rest of the week, I pray. And uh, bring us back to worship you on the Lord's Day. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.